Hi everyone, this is uh, Mike Tyree, Brandon Keaton with you this, uh, this morning. Uh, we are the Eight Oaks Recovery Hour, and we would just want to uh, say if anybody's out there, you're needing help, if you know somebody who needs help, please come and uh, call us at 1-800-576-4396. Uh, Eight Oaks has been around for a couple of years now, well actually longer than that, but we were uh, as a formal program we started a couple of years ago but we've actually been part of the jail systems and stuff for, for many years and we've also got living free that's on monday nights uh brandon keaton he uh, teaches that every monday uh, so we've been around for a while but as far as an organized program for guys coming out and living and, and having regular sessions every day we've been doing it for a couple of years and uh, we just love to help those who are hurting we love to help those that are in pain those who are suffering those that are no else no other place to go and they give us a call and we're able to come and help and that's just it it, it gives us excitement and to be able to help folks like that we've had several here lately that's been out on the street on the right uh, homeless nowhere to go and they've given us a call and we've been able to come and, and take them in and, and some of them are doing absolutely fantastic now they've gotten jobs and they're they're working and they're and they're excited and uh, one particular gentleman I'm thinking about right now, he is on fire for God, which even makes it even more sweeter. So uh, just want to uh, touch base with Brandon. Brandon, t tell me how your day has been going. I mean, you've been having a busy day. You're getting ready to go uh, on a trip this uh, this afternoon. Yep. How things going? We're getting ready to go on a little river vacation for Easter. Me and the wife and all her family. So we'll get to... Uh, Spend some time together and relax, which is something I don't get to do very often. So I'm looking forward to that. So you guys uh, kind of start new Easter traditions because you get the well, the her family's family. always done this, but so I'm the intruder, you know, <laughs> the intruder. Have married and everything. But so we're just carrying on their tradition, I guess, for Easter, which me and my family will meet Sunday after church, like we always do. So we'll come back after that and yeah. we'll spend the weekend with our family and then come back with my family. Well, yeah, you're the intruder. I, I understand that. I, I was, uh, we, it, it's been hard for us um, now because all our traditions and stuff, all our kids are grown up. And uh, we've got one at the house, or we've got two at the house, but uh, one that's still 15 years old. But Spencer and Sheldon, um, my two oldest are twins, they, they got married a couple years ago. And so they're starting their own traditions. Right. And then you know, we've got their other family involved now. And trying to schedule and navigate everything and oh, trying to yeah. figure out get, how, how do we get everybody there at the same time yeah. has been a, a challenge because we right. have five kids all together and uh, we got uh, two that are married, one that's engaged. And so we've, uh, we've got all these folks trying to come together now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they just don't do the Easter eggs like they used to want to do. You know, oh, yeah. we, used to, we used to have fun. All the traditions we used to have is so uh, we used to hide the eggs and um, in different spots and they would have clues in the eggs that would lead to the big Easter basket yeah. and we've done that ever since the kids have been little and uh, it's just not the same no more you know so yeah. our traditions are changing well, you definitely get you some grandbabies though. getting grandbabies and we're going to train them <laughs> in the ways of mom and dad yeah. and grandma and grandpa so yeah you have a grandbaby in what 11 weeks yeah, yeah, about like that. It was 10 weeks. Like no, it's less than that. I think 10 nine weeks. Like that. Nine weeks. I think yeah. we're down nine or 10 weeks now. Yeah, oh, that's so. awesome. So, going to have our first grandbaby. I said it's about time. She'll be running after Easter eggs in the year, too. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Easter's coming up. We're, uh, we're excited. I, that's one of my favorite times of the year. It's for springtime, new creation, new things happening, and a proper time for the for the Christ to come back and be resurrected. So, I just, uh, it's just a wonderful time. I mean, uh, Christmas is a, is a cool time of the year, but when you talk about it from a spiritual perspective, a religious perspective, Easter's got to outweigh uh, Christmas for me because everything that Christ was born for was yeah. done on Easter. You and know, you understand what it did for your salvation. It's everything. So Absolutely, it's it's a whole lot more weighty to me because you, you're truly remembering what He had to go through so I can live in the freedom that I live in today, which is huge you know mm -hmm. for me to every aspect of my life it's it should be me remembering what jesus did on the cross for me but it's hard for us to constantly remember that even now i mean it's you know there is a lot of traditions and things that kind of i don't not take away attention from it but sometimes we don't 
hurt like we should, remembering like we should. You know what I mean? Right. It's uh, it's more about the celebration and things. But to me, it's it's very important to remember the true meaning 100% of the time, you know? Traditions are awesome, and I like Easter egg hunting. My kids are going Easter egg hunting. We're going to have a full blast, but they're not old enough for me to tell them the story and understand it anyways, you know? Mm-hmm. So we're going to have fun. But for me, yeah, where I've come from and where I'm at, yeah. Easter is a whole lot. It hurts me. It touches me. It pulls at me a whole lot more than it does. Well, yeah, because that's the sacrifice. Yeah. You know, Christmas is, is kind of the hope, yeah. you know, and there's hope in Easter too, but there's also the element of death, and yeah. the element of sacrifice. That goes and the victory with it. is he did raise again. That is yeah, the, that's that's exactly right. You know, uh, you know. But there's he, a process. Is it? Friday's here, but Sunday's coming, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's a good song. yeah. So there's, there's obviously he's got the hope, but with that is also the death that has to come before oh, yeah. the hope. And, and at Christmas time, you just think about the hope. Here's the new Savior. Yeah. Here's a little, nice little cuddly baby, you know, and yeah. and everything is just kind of sweet. Easter brings it right down to the reality of, of what Christ came for, right. and it was that death and that burial, and, and you know, of course, we re- relate to that in our baptism when we come become that new creation yeah. in our baptism, being buried and dying, and and the hope is when you're not when you're you're put under the water. The, the hope is actually when you come back out, yeah. and that's the symbolization, of course, of of what Christ did on Easter. So yeah, um, uh, I love Easter um, and. Uh, um, I'm looking forward to a weekend of just spending time with the family and right. spending time just reflecting. I always like to get the, the, the scriptures out and go over them and read them. And communion me- means more. Everything seems to right. be more, uh, mean more at, at Easter when it comes to uh, uh, those those practices. So, right. yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Today, um, again, if you need help, 1-800-576-4396. Or you can also reach us on our website, uh, uh, eightoaksrecovery dot uh, dot org so uh, you can reach us at one of those two places we are there to help you uh, if you have a family member we're there to help them we just don't help uh, just put this in here too in case you're you're wondering we don't just don't help uh, the addicts we have a therapist that also works with our families and brings the whole family together and uh, and talks with them if, if that's so desi- desired so uh, we have a pretty good program there to try to help the guys. Um, today, uh, I thought we'd talk about, Brandon, something that we talked about in our sessions earlier this morning, was uh, something that is said in rehabs all the time. At least in our, ours we do. And we say there's only one thing that you have to change in order to become sober. And I put that question out there, all the new guys, and they'll come up with a whole list of different stuff. But what we end up saying is there's only one thing that has you have to change in order to become sober, and that's everything. Now, digging deep into that, what does it mean by everything? What is everything? And we can get down and talk about, well, you, you got to give up some of your friends. That's it. That's part of everything. Uh, you got to make sure that you don't have cash on your hands, you know, so that you don't be tempted to spend it on drugs or alcohol. So we can go through a whole litany of stuff like that, but it goes deeper than just, you know, giving up those things. Brandon, you know, I want to go a direction here. We'll go to John chapter 3 here in just a minute. But before we go there, you were there. I mean, this was your life. So when we say everything, what was everything in your life? So... I knew 150% that I had to fully surrender my life to Christ. And, and what that means is literally changing everything about me. And so different people on different walks of life, I struggle with more stuff than most people struggle with. So unfortunately, I had a whole lot more things to change than someone who was mm-hmm. who was a little bit closer to the line. But right. I, uh, I knew that I couldn't be around the same places, around the same people. But I didn't fully accept that so like even after i got sober i would try to hang around some of the old people and i wasn't doing bad things or nothing but and god would just gently remind me like okay if this is where you want to be if this is the direction you want to go that's fine but i have something far greater planned for you and so say for instance what i did my whole entire life 
before I got sober, I was an industrial electrician, automo automation specialist, electronic control technician, PLC programmer, robotics. I mean, I was into all that stuff. I traveled all over the country working for Strom Engineering, BGI, Ratchet Corp, all these places. I got a call last week or a week ago, and it was crazy. He's like, man, your, your resume is phenomenal. Like, do you still want to go work? I noticed you, you've been inactive for seven years. And I'm like, I'm just for kicks and giggles like, what y'all pay nowadays? And it blows my mind just to think how much money I could work on the road. But God said I had to change everything. That lifestyle isn't for me. Who that was is dead and gone. Like I am a new creation, all things in me. What I did for a living is completely brand new. What I, the people I hang around. Now God took away every single friend that I had. Don't get me wrong, but he gave me far greater in return. Mm -hmm. God said, okay, you can't work in these factories anymore. But he gave me something far greater mm -hmm. in return. Right. He said, I can't find this type of women attractive anymore, but I can find my lady B attractive. It's a completely <laughs> different mindset, completely, right. completely different person, but far greater. So what you're saying is that it's not just, um, I think a lot of times when the guys come in, when, when we talk about everything, they think, they think more of the mechanics of it giving this up and not doing this and and uh, changing this and changing that but but trying to get them to understand that it's deeper than just the physical change it's the way that we approach our entire life now yeah it's the mindset the thinking process changes mm -hmm. and my world view changes oh, and yeah. the way my value systems change and that whole process is different and, I, and that's what you're describing. So, I mean, every, I begged and begged and begged and begged. Every single morning when I woke up all throughout the day, when I laid my head down in the night, was, was to hear like God, to speak like God, and to walk like God. Like, those were the three things that I struggled with. And I just, the more I prayed about it, the more I prayed about it, I would say something, I was like, well, that's not very Christ-like. I would hear something, and I would, I would cling on to the negative connotation instead of seeing the light in the situation. It was, mm -hmm. it was right. constantly, man, i got to change the way I think. I gotta think about the way I think. I gotta change the way I think. I gotta change the way I process something. I gotta change the way I speak something because it all. I mean, to me, I heard something. It made me feel a certain way, and I would say something. So from the very beginning, I had to start. I wanted to hear like like God. I wanted to hear it from His point of view because as a human, we hear the negative in everything if we're not careful. Yeah. I wanted to be more positive, and in turn. You know, me finding a new life in Christ gave me this this passion, desire to be this better person with this peace and this jo joy and this understanding. And, you know, out of it came the mouth. The more of it that was inside of me, the more I spoke over people, the more positive I became. But at the very beginning, I was just negative, negative Nancy. Hmm. Everything I heard and everything I spoke was negative. <laughs> well, we had just talked about this very same subject uh, this morning about... I was I was trying to explain to the guys, you, it's always negative. You're thinking negative. You, you're negative, 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 and changing that process of. Uh, we go to Philippians four eight, and it says, "Think about those things that are true, honorable, trust, uh, trustworthy, praiseworthy, virtuous," and it has this whole litany yeah. and list of things. And I said you. Instead of thinking about what you've got to give up, instead of concentrating on, it's like it's like a person who's trying to give up cigarette smoking, and they just think, "I can't have a cigarette. I can't have a cigarette. Don't don't have the cigarette. Don't don't smell the cigarette. Don't 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 don't." And the more you think about not doing it, the more you think about doing it. Yeah. You know. So instead of trying to get your mind focused upon what you've got to give up, focusing your mind, and you said it so beautifully, the way you, you, you articulated that, Brandon, is getting your mind to think about what you're going to get. Think about on those things, what is true? And I, I said, go, it's a process of taking that scripture in Philippians 4 and 8 and meditate. So meditate. Now, it just doesn't, that, that term there, meditate, that means much more than just think about. Yeah. It's deeper than just think about. It's a it's a deep kind of think. And it's processing it, not just reading it and, and going over it, but stopping, pausing, 
hanging on a second. Let me let me dwell on this. Let me process this. Let me go over it and over and over it. Let me ask questions about it. Let me stay on this thing. So what does it mean to be true? And what we do is we go through each one of those things and we define what those things are. What is true? What is virtuous? And then say, how do I... How does that look in my life? So instead, when you get all torn up inside and you want to go negative, you want to go think about those negative thoughts, stop yourself. you got to be very intentional. You, I like how you said it because you were very intentional in what you were, you were doing yeah. in your thought process. I can't think this way no more. i got to think this way. And that's what you have to do. I can't think about that negative thing that I'm thinking about. Literally. Whatever it is. And it's just not about using the drug. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of negativity that goes along oh, yeah. with it, right? So it's stopping myself, being aware and stopping myself. Okay, now I'm going to think about something that's true. Mm-hmm. What is true in my life? What is pure in my life? What can I think about that's pure? You know, um, my thing is, is the, the, the one of the best thoughts that I can have is sitting on a deck where there's a, a cabin and there's a waterfall and I'm up and I can see the river going and I'm sitting on the on the deck in a rocking chair with a cup of coffee and there's just this nice cool breeze. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And just spending time just thinking about God and the nature and hearing the birds sing and in the and I, and I says, that's probably me just becoming an old man now. <laughs> I'm not sure, but that thought is more uh, more enjoyable than it, than it ever has been before. But thinking on those things, uh, paintings yeah. that are lovely. And look at, you know, we use it. paintings and art and all that kind of stuff has changed so much. And we, we, we talk about that. But, you know, art used to be, you know, just a simple bowl of fruit on a table and there would be a painting of that. And that's God's creation. That's something that God made. And I can dwell on that, just a simple bowl of fruit, or just just thinking about um, the picture on the wall, the, the Norman Rockwell look, or uh, just the, the scene of the of the mountains, or a portrait of somebody, and, and all the details that go into that. I mean, that's that's God's creation. That's something that's lovely to think about, and and being intentional about how to, how I approach this, and how I change this, and how I don't think this way anymore. Um, was was doing that process, was that hard for you to do that at the beginning? Oh, yeah. To, to, to flip that and the be, because you had to be very intentional. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about that struggle. Of, and so it matters greatly where you're at and who's around you. And so me coming from, say, I read a whole bunch of people lost in the drug world. And even if people aren't calling you a drug addict or a needle junkie or a meth head, like you're labeled that in your head anyways, that's what you're hearing. Yeah. You're constantly being told. Whether people are thinking that or not. Yeah, you're never gonna be the devil's telling you 150 percent. Mm-hmm. Whether you're never gonna be enough, you're always gonna be this way, you're never gonna get free, you're never gonna get clean, mm-hmm. you're broken, you're washed up, you're nothing. Like you you will never amount to anything. This is who you are. I've got you. My foot's on top of you. You'll never get away from it. That's, that's literally the, the words that the, the devil speaks over you constantly. And you believe that and to such a point to where it puts you in the corner of the room and you just want to kill yourself. Like it's, you're done living this way. You can't get away from the voices. You can't get away from the torture. You can't get away from nothing. So mm-hmm. that's all that's been in your brain. And then you get sober. Yeah. And dude, it, there is this massive battle going on between good and evil. And if you don't know the Word of God, if you don't have the, the Holy Spirit helping you, it is impossible. Because you don't know the truths that God spoke over you. You don't know that you are redeemed and bought with a price. You don't know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that all can be forgiven. That, that weight that you're carrying around is not yours. You don't know what He speaks over you. You don't know the visions that He's going to give you. You don't know the plan He has for your life because you're not in tune with that. But when you start to read the Bible, as I did in jail, as I started to remember all these things that my, my dad spoke over me, my mom spoke over me, my grandmother spoke over me, old youth ministers, old pastors, what they said, I was going to be who they could see me being in the future and being a minister and being able to preach the gospel and all the stuff that they told me, I started to remember. And I started to remember the Sunday school lessons and I started to remember how much I know about the Bible because I actually did know quite a bit More about than what it. You thought you did. But I chose right. to push that back because the devil's voice was way louder to me in that moment. 
And so I started to remember all these things of who God is. God didn't change, I did. And it was still that constant. But whenever I started to produce a lot, I can, in fact, be healed and believe that. And I was healed of Crohn's disease, anxiety, depression. I was on tons of medications. I went to the doctor all the time because my small intestines couldn't fend for itself. Like, mm. I believed God was going to heal me, and he did. No one spoke over me. No one prayed over me. No one laid hands on me. I, I don't know when I got healed. I don't know how it happened. I don't know, but I started to believe in my Creator, and there's power that comes right. in that. And once you believe in that, the way you start to think starts to be more like Christ, more yeah. Christ-like. And so the, then the people that you surround yourself is so important. And that's what with guys like at Adox, I don't know you from nobody, but I'm going to speak life over you. I'm going to tell you that you are a child of God. I'm going to tell you you are forgiven. You are redeemed. God's got a plan for you and a purpose for you. All you have to do is walk in obedience to what he says, to what he, he instills inside of you. Just obey, obey, obey. He loves you. He loves you. I'm proud of you. Golly, you know how many addicts never hear I'm proud of you? Or, or this this one's extremely simple. Good job. Mm. You're never told that. Yeah. Never told. And, and even so, you start getting clean, and you've hurt so many people that's important to you. They don't trust you. You're not forgiven yet. I mean, they may say it, but there's a process. And even though they see you doing good, it's hard for them to believe because well, he's done this before. He's been here before. Now, my my one thing I love about my father and all my guys love and granny uh, Matt every time he sees them hey man I love you I'm pr I'm proud of you yeah and I've, I've got that from my dad because I try to tell and you know in living free class every Monday you hear these guys say that they're two weeks sober and we want to applaud that tell them how good of a job we see that may not seem like something monumental to people out there listening but for a, an addict who's been lost two to weeks. addiction for 10 years that is huge yeah, absolutely but not nobody telling them good job their family, I guarantee their family saying two weeks. What is that? Yeah. You know? So being surrounded by people who are going to speak life over you constantly. And so what that does to you is you're like, huh, maybe I'm not a waste. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can do this. Well, I see Joe over here doing it. Maybe I can do it too. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you hear people speak positivity about themselves That's good. in a circumstance where they shouldn't. And that's what starts to change. I taught last night about Joseph, Genesis 39 through 41, him being thrown into prison for something that he didn't do. Mm -hmm. You know, and the whole entire time, it never says for the two years he was in there, it doesn't say he whined, he complained, he went in a corner, he kicked, he screamed, he asked God why, he did this, he did that. It said the jailer saw the Spirit of God was with him. Yeah. So he made him leader over the jail. And he became the best prisoner he could be. Ain't that crazy? In jail. <laughs> Wherever you're at, be the best for God that you can be, yeah. right? And so it, it makes me think about being in situations like that to where these guys, people in jail, people in rehab, they have every reason to pitch a pity party. They have every reason mm -hmm. to be, but you see these guys start to flourish. They see, you see their minds start to change the way they think. Yeah. They start to handle a situation they would have handled a month ago completely different yeah they then not only get faith in god but they get faith in their self like i i'm not i'm not a waste i can do good i am capable of doing well right. <laughs> it's it's just this whole process what's well, a cool level. thing you know romans uh romans 12 um you know talks about not being conformed mm -hmm to this world, but be transformed by the renewing yeah, of your mind. Daily. Yeah, daily. And I like to use an illustration of the Transformers. Yeah. You know, my kids, Spencer and Sheldon, Christian, all of them were, were, were young. They had Transformer toys. And if you get the really expensive ones, they were really, uh, you know, detailed and yeah. intricate and, and how to change it. And man, you'd go there and you're like, you start changing that thing and trying to get it from the robot to the car or the car to the robot, whichever way you were going. There was a part in there when you started the process. It looked like a mess. Uh, you could. It didn't look like a robot. It didn't look like a car. And you're like, I don't know what to do with this thing, you know. And so you just start trying to figure it out and you keep at it. And all of a sudden you see something that kind of looks like a head of a robot. And you're like, wow. Man, I could... I can start. I, then you get excited. 
some as, as simple and silly as that is, but you do, you kind of get excited. Yeah. Then you start thinking, hey, maybe I can figure this thing out. Right. Maybe I, I didn't think I, it looked like a mess, but now that I got a little bit, I can see the, the head there a little bit. Maybe I could put the rest of it together. Now. Right. But before it was, you begin to wonder if you could do it. Yeah, no, it seemed impossible. It seemed, it just seemed like a bunch of plastic joints just all kind of yeah. twisted all together. And it, and the only thing that kept you going is that you know other people have done it. Yeah. So if they did it, maybe I can do it too. Yeah. Uh, and so if you just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, and all of a sudden you see the head, then you think, ah, let's move this piece. And then you start moving this piece. Now you can see an arm, and then you can see leg. And then all of a sudden that thing is just it's standing up about, you know, about two feet up in the air and it's all made up. And you're like, I did it. Yeah. I made it. I created that, you know. And I think that's so much how it is um, in addiction. It's the idea that when you're trying to come into sobriety that you're so fixed on the mess that you're looking at right now that you don't know if you can do this. Oh, yeah. You know, if you can make it. Um, Not but changing people. and transforming is a process. That's why they call it transforming. Yeah. And that's because it's not a light switch that you turn on and turn off. You know, even even with somebody that just decided, I'm not going to use no more, I'm not going to drink no more, there's still a transformation that has to take place. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they're white knuckling there for a while, but there's got to be something that happens with God inside that begins to transform and you begin to see the world different. You start your mind starts changing, and you have to be intentional, like you were. I got to think different. Yeah. If I'm going to make it, I got to think different than the way I'm thinking now. And when I say begging, I mean that. Mm. I'm talking about it was so bad in my brain. I was begging God to take these thoughts from me. Begging God to, if it's not from you, or, or because of you, like get it out of my head. I walk it to the front door. I let it outside. Get them demons on out of here. They right, ain't right. welcome him no more. I had, and I tell about my, my testimony, and sometimes it's it's to make joke of, of me and my brain and where it was at. But like literally, sometimes I had to to walk things to the front door and tell them, "You're not welcome in this house. This house is a sanctuary. This is a safe place. This is a holy place." And mm -hmm. the things that are in my head is not of God. Yeah, that's deep. That's dark. That that isn't that isn't here. Mm, I mean, and literally good. putting a covering over my house and saying, "This is my safe place. You aren't welcome here. You aren't. Yeah. I have power over you." The Holy Spirit is within me. I can walk you to the front door and I can say, get out of here. You, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that prayer that you're doing, it yeah. reminds me of something we talked about in, in sessions a couple of days ago, is uh, the, the Lord just kind of put it up on me. And I got, I got thinking, you know, you guys are praying that you don't have the desire to drink anymore. You don't have, you pray that you don't have the desire to use anymore. I said, your, your prayer is weak. You need to be praying, God, help that drug, help that alcohol be so disgusting to me, so despicable to me, that it makes me want to throw up just thinking about the stuff. Yeah. I can't stand to be around it. I don't want to be around it. God, give me that. Not just that I don't have a desire, but that it makes me so disgusted just to think about it or just to, 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 the, the subject matter. I don't ever want to go there again. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to revisit it. I don't want to uh, share old war stories anymore. It's so disgusting to me that I don't want to have anything to do with it. God put that in me. Mm -hmm. And having those kinds of prayers is is part of that changing the transformation in your mind too. Yeah. Is because you're just not looking at it as just something casual. Just take that desire away from me. But God, let me throw up. Let me get sick just thinking about it. You know. So mm -hmm. I think that's all part of it too. Because your 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 prayers were intentional, weren't they? Yeah. You were you were going after it. you were God. You know. You gotta change the way I think here. I think from in jail to in rehab to out, it it developed a very big prayer life. I I pray bold prayers because I know who God is, mm -hmm. and it's not me asking God to do something that's outside His will. It's it's more so me being praying on the behalf of others or me praying that His will be done and and that. His spirit is evident in my life, and that everybody I come in contact see stuff like that. But there's certain things that you got to understand, especially renewing your mind, is that it is a war, and mm -hmm. the only person that has power to win that war is God. And I'm calling on the one person 
And I'm begging the one person who's got the power to change all that in my life. Right. To free me from all. I mean, I was in chains and bondage, just evilness. And I'm, I'm a super spiritual guy. And I literally saw it as demons attached to me that would not let me go. And the thing is, I invited them in. I told them to come hang out, stick around, walk with me, talk with me. But now I'm begging the Holy Spirit, you were all I want. And I will do whatever I can do to prove that to you. I, I will... I will walk by your way. Anything you want me to do. Where you tell me to go, I'll go. What you ask me to do, I'll do. Yeah. And I've lied to you for a long time. But I'm here to prove myself. I'm here to do it right. Just help me. Just help me. And just the thought process, man, of putting God in His rightful place. Without you, I am nothing. This is what I do without you. I desperately need you. I need your covering. I need your protection. I don't want to go somewhere where your hedge will not cover me any longer. All these things. I won't look at something... I mean, what you put in is what comes out. Well, again, you know, just listening to you, you, you were thinking about what to put into yourself. That's where I had to stop. You, <laughs> yeah, because most guys they think about what they got to get out. They got to get out all that stuff. They got to get give up this. And they got to yeah. give up that. And they got to stop this. And your approach uh, was not what I got to get out. It was what I got to put in. Yeah. And I think that's key. Don't you think that's well, key? From the very, very beginning of this is you can never get rid of something without replacing it with something else. That's right. And Green spoke on it a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. If you're going to remove something, right. you, you've got to fill that void, and it's got to be from God. Yeah. If not, you're going to be chasing to fill that void. Like we always do. Humans do that. Mm -hmm. When something is removed from us, you fill that void yeah. with something. Well, a lot of times these guys will replace it from uh, that thing instead of God, instead of uh, the Philippians 4 and 8, true, pure, holy, righteous, you know, uh, praise report, they'll replace it with another addiction. Yeah. Or well, something that's not as bad or in as the eyes bad. of the world. Right. It's, I've heard this a hundred times. I worked over, what are we at now, 90 guys? I don't even have a clue. But like, they always say, well, at least I ain't got a need them all. At least <laughs> yeah, I ain't Like, I hear that, but God wants all of right. you. God's, He is proud of you. Right. 150%. I tell some of my guys, now, I'm so proud of you. But you're going to quit smoking cigarettes in Jesus' name. And I'm not going to give you a raise until he does. Like, he is very, very proud of you. But he wants all of you. Every single bit of you. Every single avenue of you. Every I don't understand why smoking cigarettes that big. If all you can think about right now is, I want a cigarette, I want a cigarette, I want a cigarette. God's trying to tell you something super important direct your life. But all you can think about is, I want a cigarette, I want a cigarette, I want a cigarette. You can't tell me that it's not only killing you, but getting in the way of your thought process and mm -hmm. what God has. You're not going to have the peace. You're not going to have the joy. You may think, and everybody thinks this, I thought that too. I smoked cigarettes for forever. It's, that's what, I can finally breathe again. I start smoking a cigarette. Man, I, I, I don't feel like someone's sitting on my chest no more. I'm not anxious. Right. Like it helps me. And it's such a lie from the enemy. It's like, but that's what you think the whole entire time is, well, at least, I'm, at least I'm not doing this. Man, smoking cigarettes. And I told my dad that over and over. My dad kept saying, you'll change. And I said, when the Holy Spirit tells mm -hmm. me to, I will. He said, and he will. And sure enough, and he did. I love you, yeah, man. yeah. He's awesome. He, but I told my dad that, and I just now remember that. But so now my guys are telling me the same things I told my dad whenever he's right. His right. dad would always be on me. You don't need to smoke. I, was like, I know, but at least I'm not. And to me, I mean, it was. It's. 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 You're changing so much, so much. Everything about you. Yeah. Everything. But our flesh wants to hold on to. As little as we can, as much as we can, as, as, as for, for some reason. I don't know. And I, I just always pick at them, too. And I ain't picking at nobody that smokes cigarettes. But I, I, I always I was, listen, you're not, you're not going to wake up one day and think, man, I wish I didn't quit smoking cigarettes six years ago. That was a horrible decision. You're not going to say that. That's right. You're just not going to say it. Yeah. That challenged me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Yeah. No one ever says that, do you? You may live 100 years old. It may not affect your health one bit, but, but you ain't going to wake up and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have quit. That was crazy. Yeah, when that thing, when you have to argue and, and defend that habit, that should be a clue, a red flag. Something's wrong here. Yeah. Something, if I have to defend it to this extent, maybe there's something wrong with me. Yeah. You know? Um, John, uh, uh, go to John chapter three, and uh, in John chapter three, it, it, um, by the way, if you give that number out for anybody who's been listening to us, one eight hundred five seven six four three nine six, one eight hundred five seven six four three nine six, 
or reach us at uh, eightoaksrecovery.org, eightoaksrecovery.org. All right, John chapter 3, uh, uh, we're going into the Easter uh, weekend, and uh, tomorrow, um, well, today, or it would be uh, today, um, actually, when this recording is, is comes to play, uh, will be Palm Sunday, or not Palm Sunday, be, uh, um, yeah, help me out, three days before Friday. Good Friday, Good Friday. Friday. thank you. <laughs> it just totally left me. So Good Friday, be Good, good Friday. And uh, the whole reason why we have a Good Friday, the whole reason why we have Easter is because of John chapter 3. John chapter 3 gives us beautiful, beautiful story about a man by the name of Nicodemus who was a Jew of the Jew of the Jew. I mean, he was on the Sanhedrin court. The Sanhedrin was like the ultimate authority outside of the Roman Empire, you know, Roman government within the Jewish communities. The Sanhedrin was the law of the land. And they, they're the ones that you would go to in front of a, a, the court system. They were the court. They were the ones that make the decisions. And uh, so Nicodemus was on the Sanhedrin, and he was one of the main guys uh, on the Sanhedrin. He had a reputation. Everybody knew who Nicodemus was. But when... Jesus came on the scene, he saw something in Jesus that was different. With all the training that he had, with all the teachings that he'd had, he had never seen anything or anybody like Jesus. Jesus was uh, was a rabbi and he had a following, which was not really different in that time period. That was kind of a fad. You would have a rabbi, you, and they would, he would have disciples, and they would follow them. So that was nothing new. But what was new was that Jesus brought something to the table that nobody else did. He brought, he brought the power of God's Spirit. He brought the miracles. He brought different kinds of teaching that had never been heard before. Things that we take for granted. And when we go to um, uh, when we go to Matthew five, six, and seven, Sermon on the Mount. You know, you, you look through there. And a lot of that stuff we take for granted, you know. Um, we take the Beatitudes, you know. We take, you know, um, uh, the, the teachings that was there on Galilee. And he talks about the divorce. And he talks about, you know, um, uh, I'm a, you, you have heard it said this way, but I say to you. Talk about the salt and the light and all of those things that we just take for granted. But during those times, those things were revolutionary you know loving your neighbor do you know if your eye offending pluck it out i mean all of these things were revolutionary and nicodemus saw something different in not just his teaching but in the miracles and just the way that he presented himself he knew there was something different so he comes in the middle of the night to see jesus gets a meeting schedules that meeting middle of the night why the middle of the night he's on the sanhedrin He's got a position. He's prominent. He don't want nobody to know he's going to go see and talk with this revolutionary teacher that everybody in the religious circle was saying, we got to get rid of this guy. But Nicodemus saw something different. So he goes and has this conversation with Jesus. And as he's talking with Jesus, his heart is moved. And Jesus gives him more revolutionary kind of uh, uh, thoughts. And he says, you know, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And of course, we know what that is today. Most anybody who's gone to church, we know that's not literal, but in his mind, he's like, oh, what are you talking about, Jesus? You know, you know, my mama's dead and gone. What, you know, you know, what am I supposed to do? You know, how's that supposed to happen? How's that look? You know, and, uh, and then of course, Jesus says, unless you were born of the water and the spirit, and there is the difference when you have the spirit in you, your nature changes. Yeah. Your life changes. And Nicodemus is really questioning Jesus on this, and he's trying to understand this. And here's what I want to get going back to that original question that we started out with, was 
There's only one thing that you've got to change in order to become sober, and that's everything. And Jesus was presenting to Nicodemus, and he's saying, Nicodemus, if you want to follow me, you've got to be born again. That means you've got to rethink how you do everything. The process has got to change. Your worldview, your value systems have got to change. Everything's got to change. You are a new creation. Now you're a new, you're, you've got a new nature about you. You're a completely different person. You might look the same. You may walk the same. You know, the accents that you have in your voice are still the same, but you are different. Yeah. A different person. You look at life differently. You don't look at the negativity. You look at the positive. You look at what I can do for you, not what you've done to yourself. And this is the change that has to take place. Now, in the in the movie, uh, the show Chosen, they do a wonderful, wonderful job uh, presenting that scene of Nicodemus and Jesus coming together. Now, what they uh, they've kind of ad libbed and put this in, into the script. This this last part where there's an invitation for Nicodemus to come and follow him as one of the disciples, and in that scene, even though it's ad libbed, it's really not in the scriptures that way. It still makes a good point where. Nicodemus is behind a wall and there's in their meeting they're all meeting up all the people that want to follow Jesus are meeting and they're going to be taking off and Nicodemus is behind the wall sobbing and crying because he wants to so bad but he just can't give up that lifestyle of being on the Sanhedrin and his wife in the social club in the social circles and all of that that goes with it he just couldn't give it up at that moment. And Jesus uh, and Jesus was just so gentle, and he says, you know, almost came, you came that close. You came that close. And how many addicts come that close? How many guys that you've worked with have come that close? Yeah. And just, and you thought, man, they're tore up, they're sobbing, they're crying, they're, 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 they get the message but there's just something that they gotta hang on to. That one thing they got just gotta hang on to that, yeah. and and they're so focused on what they gotta give up that they're not focusing in on what they're getting and what they're receiving. And in that conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, Jesus was sharing in, in the in the show chosen. Jesus is saying, "Yeah, you gotta give up a lot. Yeah, you will. You're older. You know, you, you you've got established life." Yeah, you've got a lot to give up more than what most people do. Yeah. But what you're going to get back in return is nothing compared to what you're giving up. I mean, my wife, even, so even after uh, being sober for four or five years, we were laying in bed one night and I was like, God's going to ask us to sell everything and start over one day. And she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, I just... I know God's going to test me to see if I'm attached to everything that I've built or if this is my kingdom for two kingdom. He's going to ask me to sell everything and start over. I just got this feeling. Like, mm. He's going to do that. And a lot of times I feel like God puts something in that to see if you're honest about yourself anyways. And right. he, sometimes he don't actually make you walk that out. Well, it was funny because... The you know, Isaac and Abraham yeah, Isaac thing. Absolutely. You know? And then mm. so two years later, we're sitting there just torn because... The place that we got engaged in, the place that we got married in, a place that I've owned for 12 years, a place that we never thought we would ever sell, and we'd honestly die there. Like, we, we love that house, we love everything about it, and it, it wasn't working, which is so crazy because no matter what we tried, the boys couldn't sleep here, the boys couldn't do that, Ricker wouldn't stay upstairs, he was coming down the stairs, we had a couple of scares of falling down the stairs, had to do this, had all these, all these just stuff that made no sense, and we ended up donating a house to Eight Oaks, we ended up buying it back, we ended up redoing mm -hmm. it, we ended up moving into it. And it's like, Lydia B, when we get moved into it, she's like, you remember when you said you were going to have to sell everything and start over? And she was like, we literally had to sell, I mean, it was it was extremely difficult on us, but here was the here was the vision. So we sold something that we absolutely, we still not sold it, but we, we, we literally moved out of something that we loved. And I go up there to that house and I'm like, holy smokes, are we crazy? Why, why do we move out of this? But it's because where God's trying to take us and we aren't going to reap these benefits till 20 years from now. We won't get a house like that again for 20 years, or probably. But it's 
where he's trying to take us, there was something so much more important than where we were living. And we couldn't see it like in the moment or while we were having to move or while we were having to relocate, but it was, God has something so much greater for us than how big our house is. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Something that we never thought we would let go of, something we never thought we would get rid of, but God says, in order for me to take you where you're wanting to go, we have to rearrange everything. And so we did, and we still haven't made it to the, to the end of that little journey inside that house, but it's still something we never expected God to ask us to do. And then it was something that we denied 15 times over, and we kept saying, no, 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 no. We, we tried to adjust this, we tried to adjust this, and nothing was working. So until we listened to what God was telling us, nothing worked, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. All he wanted us to do was obey, and he was. we tried everything under the sun to rearrange it, to adjust it, to make it work for this, but it just wasn't working. It just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Now, it all makes sense 20 years from now. And I'll say, well, this is, <laughs> this is why we did this, or this is why we did that. Or, yeah. But sometimes he's going to ask you to, even after your, even it doesn't have to be about sobriety. It doesn't. Sometimes right. God's going to ask you to change everything. It's part of life, yeah. Everything. So your walk with God, it's <laughs> out. That's that's the journey that we're on, it right? It is. Yeah. We moved into a house half the size that we've already outgrown. We got another baby on the way. She's 18 weeks pregnant. We got a third boy, and we're like, "What are we going to do?" Right. <laughs> you know, the journey. But it's 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 still we're going to have to add on or do this or do that. But what's crazy is the boys sleep. We wake up rested. We sleep like we've never slept. It works, mm-hmm. which is super weird. Yeah. That's how God, when you obey, it works, whatever it looks like. And so I had to get to the realization a long time ago that whenever God asks you to do something, no matter what direction that is, you you better do it. Mm-hmm. Even for fleshly desires, if you don't want to, it's just going to be a worse ride in the end. <laughs> I'm, right. I try to be extremely quick to obey nowadays because I know God always has what's in my best interest, but... It's hard to see that coming from so much lies that I was always told, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so even even after getting sober, those things don't change. He's going to... I learned to not get attached to things, I guess. Because God will ask you to change everything. And there's been multiple, multiple times throughout the past six and a half years to where God's literally changed everything. Where I went to a... I had, up 11 guys one time and, and, and I could see it was getting out of hand we had a, a few bud apples doing this and, and, I, and I could tell that, I mean I got so overwhelmed one day and ended up literally getting rid of every single person but one person I literally had to change everything and start all back over and I'm like oh my goodness this isn't what you it couldn't be what you had planned for me like this is ridiculous <laughs> and the thing is like people don't understand the repercussions behind that because I had jobs planned out for a year right. with having 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 guys all the time and then you get down to Right now we're we're back at the same predicament. We got seven guys when we're used to having eleven or twelve, and so I'm getting behind schedule because I plan to have all my guys, and then it's like, where do they go? Right. What happened? I've got I've got guys that it's just sometimes you and I had to literally back up and punt and change my whole entire business strategy because God wanted me to spend an ample amount of time with just Matt Atkins is what I figured out, but I had to change everything because that one that one person deserved it. He was worth it. And so I, I could probably tell you... And that's when the people are become more important than the business. Yeah, it wasn't about making money. It was about yeah. saving a life. <laughs> right. And, in that, and somehow, weirdly as that sounds, somehow it works and your business is blessed and your business grows yeah. from that. It's just got... It's, I don't understand does. why. <laughs> now, you sit down here with a businessman... You know, I and you're going to say, that's, that's, that's not a good business strategy. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to change that plan a little yeah. bit, you know. But God has a way of doing things upside down and backwards. Just 100%. like the story of Nicodemus, you know, the end of that story is, is that we know from Scripture that Nicodemus made it, you uh, know. Uh, because we know that he was there at the time of Christ's crucifixion. We know that he was trying to have defense for, for Christ. And then at his burial, he was the one that was there uh, helping prepare the body uh, for burial. And he, 
So even if you have wavering moments, even though you you mess up, and have you ever messed up before? Quite a bit. I, I, I know. I, I, I don't have paper long enough to, I, uh, to write down my mess ups and screw ups. But you know, in the midst of all of that, God sees our hearts. And and man, that's 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 the bottom line is where does God see us and where does He see our heart and that's that's the bottom line is God changing my heart changing the way that I think and and in that process miraculous things happen supernatural things happen things that we couldn't imagine begin to take place and blessings that come where we didn't expect those blessings yeah and uh, and I, I remember so many times in, in in the past when I was you know pastoring and uh, going to go to the store literally by water and toilet paper yeah and uh, went and got the mail brought it to my wife went back in the car and she said yay come here come here come here and so, so out of nowhere anonymously there was a hundred dollar gift card to Walmart and so we were able to go buy a hundred dollars worth of, of groceries that's cool <laughs> so I, I got more than just the water and the and, oh that was bread that's what it was I literally water and bread it wasn't it wasn't toilet paper it was water and bread and uh, and I just thought that was so uh, ironic and funny that I was going to get brought water and bread, and God blesses me with everything. That's awesome. You know, and I don't understand it. I don't explain it. Nobody knew, you know, how desperate we were at the moment. But God does, man. And when you live for Him and you do for Him and you put people first above your own selfishness, that makes a big difference. It does. And it changes everything. So even even from everything, meaning starting on the inside out, we talked about our thought process, which is 100% the first thing that's got to be changed to the people you hang out with, to the things that you're watching, the things that you're looking at, the things that is being inputted, to even the type of stuff you eat affects the way you think, affects the way you walk, affects the way you talk, to the uh, playing too many sports, you're not playing enough sports, being active, being not active. Like there's there's so many things that you have to change to create this this new lifestyle. And it's crazy to me, I was at a, I was at a, a hardware store on the north end of town and a guy I've seen a hundred times, grew up with his kids, He's known me for forever. I've been in there 15 times over the last two years, you know, and I, I, I just assumed it was funny because he said, uh, now who's this guy to? I said, put the warranty under my name. And he was like, and who are you? I said, Brandon Keaton. Well, I know Brandon Keaton my whole life. And it was just funny because even my image changed. Right. I don't even look the That's same awesome, anymore. man. Yeah. Which is crazy. He didn't even recognize me. Right. Yeah. I don't look... The person he knew seven eight years ago just completely different, yeah. which is weird because you even change your style, the clothes you wear, the, I mean everything mm -hmm. about you, and you don't even realize you're doing it. Right? Just God changes everything. Yeah. Which is so so cool because once you sur you surrender, you surrender. God changes everything. Mm -hmm. Our job is to surrender daily, anything and everything. Yeah. God will literally change everything which is so cool to see that process take place in young men and women's life or oh it's 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 the most i don't know it's it's like you see a miracle take place but it's over a couple chapters not instantly it's it's mm -hmm. just a super rare thing to see but when you see it take place and it's over the course of months or even years but like you have witnessed something and been a part of something that not many people get to see. And it's just, it's truly God's hand performing a miracle little by little every single day, which is everything. <laughs> That's it, everything, yeah. And, and as you go after God, somehow there's naturally those things, those desires begin to dwindle and go away, don't they? They do. Yeah, so... Again, circling back to some of the stuff we already talked about, it's the idea of not 
focusing so much about what I got to give up. It's focusing on God Himself. Yeah. Focusing on serving Him and loving Him. And as I get closer to Him, the those other things naturally begin to desires begin to go away until they even make me dis, they they're disgusting to me. Mm-hmm. Those things. And he becomes prominent in my life. And now I want those things and I desire those things. So we're circling right back to that. If you want to give up everything, how do you do that? You you start meditating upon him. You start meditating upon those things that are righteous and holy and pure and virtuous and honorable, noble, you know, those things. Yeah. If I start getting my mind flooded with those things in my life, God becomes more sovereign in my life, becomes the ruler of my life, and I'm not the ruler anymore. And so those negative thoughts begin to pass away. They don't become as strong. They get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And those the, the things of God, the thoughts of God, become stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's, that's where we're at. That's where we need to be at. Um, but we're going to be wrapping this up in just a few minutes, Brandon. Um, again, 1-800-576-4396 if, if you're needing some help out there um, or adoaksrecovery.org. Um, as we're getting ready to close out, um, we're about ready to, to wrap up for the Living Free. Uh, this coming week, wrap up um, the last session uh, of our Stepping into Freedom, our 12-step program. Uh, the guys, what have you seen, the growth that you've seen in these guys over these last uh, 11, 12 weeks? And uh, and the guys are looking forward to it, by the way. <laughs> Everybody out there, when he gets done with the course with one of our books, Brandon takes all the guys over to his house and he cooks them uh, brisket, Fixes them um, full beef tenderloin, yeah, or tomahawk, tomahawk, steaks, yes, jalapeno poppers. And <laughs> I'm telling you what, my mouth, is like, dro- my mouth is drooling right now yeah. just thinking about it. The guys love it, and they've already been talking about it. Yeah. So uh, it's a t- time of fellowship, a time of uh, socializing, awesome. and getting together, and realizing that there, you can have fun outside of the drugs. There's fun outside of all that stuff. Because after a while, that's not fun anymore anyway. So it's learning on how to have fun, and, and we do that. You know, yeah. We have a great time doing it. So what did, what did they learn real it's quick? Super cool in class to say stepping into freedom teaches you how to, uh, it really teaches you how to forgive yourself and to forgive others and, and to uh, to be reconciled with your family, to be reconciled with other relationships, to understand which ones need help and which ones need to be mm-hmm. gone a different way. So it, right. it really helps you work through those emotions because a lot of times an addict what we're struggling with the most is we hurt people and we were hurt by people and we don't know how to deal with that Mm -hmm. and this book really really helps you weed through those spots biblically on how to be reconciled or other relationships that would further cause harm to even reach out like but you still have to deal with it you still have to to digest it to deal with it to move on from it and that this book really really helps you do that and it's super cool to see guys come through that were quiet about this or, or barely spoke or barely said a word and then at the end of it they're like the ones that will you please be quiet oh, right there. <laughs> they just come out of their shell you can just tell that mm-hmm. like you've been freed from this and mm-hmm. you know that you have authority over it you speak about it you can you can tell that God's done something mm-hmm. and there's there's always three or four that you can tell oh they got it but then there's always you know it just it just depends it's, it's super cool to see the light bulbs go off and, and guys guys truly learn how that to is definitely that is definitely one of the greatest uh, joys and benefits we have doing what we do with the guys is to see that light bulb yeah I, it's so cool it man. Is. just to see I got it you know <laughs> their head down all discouraged depressed and then slowly by slowly you see that hope and all of a sudden boom yeah. it, it clicks and that's just so exciting it is so, uh, so every Monday night, six o'clock, living free. We eat at six o'clock, and then we have a lesson six thirty to eight. So mm-hmm. we would love to have anybody that would want to come join us. We won't be there the next Wednesday. We'll be at my house, but then we'll pick mm-hmm. back uh-huh. up. That'll be uh, 
April the eighth. We'll be April the eighth. We'll start a brand new, brand new book, brand new twelve week program. So one last thing before we we call it. Um, we're Brandon. I'm thinking about having uh, uh, one of the ladies, a couple of ladies or something, yeah. uh, coming on the radio program on the on the, uh, on the lady side, so yeah, that they awesome. can talk about the right. uh, living free on the on the women's side. So I know that they do a lot of stuff with the jails. Oh, yeah. They do a lot of stuff really personal one on one with the ladies. So they do a great job. So we're thinking about trying to have uh, some of them come on and share their stories. So folks, we appreciate you. All the listeners out there, just keep Eight Oaks in mind. If you want to help out in any way, give uh, donations, uh, give your time, uh, donations of money, donations of, of clothing, uh, hygiene products, food, whatever it might be. We're, we, are, we are in need of that all the time. It's constant. So just be praying for us also. We're starting our work program. We've got it going. We're we can hopefully open up our new our new house here pretty soon. So just keep us in mind, keep your prayers with us. And uh, we're trying to change one life at a time. So be with us. We love you all. God bless you and have a great Easter weekend.